Adley, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I don't know what Craig told you, so you may hear the same stories twice. I, I hope not. <clears throat> I um, teach a class, I taught a class for years at Northwestern, <clears throat> the Kellogg School, and one of the rules there is that the students get to critique the professor at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. And a lot of attention is paid to those critiques. One year I was reading the critiques of my two hour seminar. And as I read it, it said, Professor Minow, if I only had two hours left to live for the rest of my life, I would choose to spend it in your seminar. <laughs> I was so touched and so proud of it, I brought it home, showed it to my wife, who has better eyes than I have. She held it up to the light, and she said, what's that little asterisk after then? And I looked at the bottom of the page and said, see other side. I turned the page, and it said, it would seem like eternity. <laughs> I don't want to seem like eternity today. I'm going to talk uh, briefly, but I do have to tell you one story. I went to hear Erskine Bowles a few weeks ago, and he was in Chicago. He comes from North Carolina, and he told a story. He said, I had an uncle, a favorite uncle, who died in his 90s in a small town in North Carolina. And the obituary writer for the local small town newspaper called his widow and interviewed her to get some anecdotes for the obituary. And she talked to him about a half hour, and he called back 45 minutes later. He said, I've written a draft of the obituary. It's 800 words. I've turned it into my editor. He thinks it's marvelous. But he said, I should warn you, we charge $5 a word. <laughs> she said, oh, forget it. She said, 800 words, $5 a word. So just make it very simple. Just say, Sam died. <laughs> and he said, you're sure that's what you want? He said, Sam died. Called back 15 minutes later, and he said, uh, I turned in the second draft of the obituary, and my editor asked me to call you and tell you that we have a five-word minimum. <laughs> So you're entitled to three more words. What would you like to say? She said, let me think a minute. And she said, let's make it Sam died, Cadillac for sale. <laughs> <laughs> My point is that every word counts. Um, Adley told you, I went to work for Governor Stevenson. I had uh, served in the China Burma India Theater as an Army Sergeant when I was 18 years old. And I came back with an interest in politics and public service, particularly how to avoid getting into another war. And when I went to college at Northwestern, where I met my wife, I uh, was headed Stevenson for governor on the campus of Northwestern. I never met Adlai Stevenson at that time, but we were honored with an invitation to his inauguration. Years, uh, four years later, when I um, was asked by Governor Stevenson to join him uh, in his race for the second term as governor, uh, I went to say goodbye to my then boss, the Chief Justice of the United States at the Supreme Court, Fred Vinson. And I asked him if I could leave a week early. The court's term was over, there was nothing going on. I said, I want to go to the Democratic Convention. And the Chief Justice looked at me and he said, uh, you, your guy's not going to get it. I said, what do you mean? He said, I, uh, Chief Justice Vinson was very close to President Truman. The Chief Justice said, I uh, had dinner last night with President Truman, 
And he's lost patience with Adley. He doesn't say yes, he doesn't say no. And it's going to be Alvin Barkley. Alvin Barkley then was the Vice President of the United States. And uh, I went to Chicago and I met with Governor Stevenson's key aides, Carl McGowan, Bill Blair, and I told them the story. They said, that's ridiculous. Well, it turned out it was true. The uh, Truman tried to get the nomination for Barkley, but the delegates said he's too old. And uh, that threw it open again, and the convention was totally open, and Adlai Stevenson was drafted. I didn't know what this meant in terms of my job. I was hired to go to work for him as the governor, to work in the uh, governor's office. But the uh, governor invited me over to uh, Bill Blair's parents' house where he was staying. He met with me and he said, now, he said, I hired you to work with me as governor. If you don't want to stay, you don't have to. I said, well, of course I want to stay. It's going to be more, uh, more exciting than ever. So I then arrived for my office in the governor's mansion just as the presidential campaign was about to begin. And my first assignment was to find a place for the new campaign staff, which we thought would be maybe a half a dozen people. And I found a house that was for rent down the street. And Governor Stevenson came over to look at it to approve it. And he said, yeah, and he said they can sleep up in the bedrooms up there and save money from the hotel. That was the vision he had and we all had of the campaign. It turned out there were hundreds of people in the staff and a big office and it was a great surprise. Stevenson lost that election, but he um, enlightened the country. And as he said, uh, I heard him say many times, he said, a political campaign should be an educational opportunity, an opportunity for the candidate to learn, and an opportunity for the voters to learn, an opportunity for both to be educated. Unfortunately, that isn't quite true uh, these days. Stevenson uh, ran and lost in 52. In um, 55, uh, he ran again and lost. There was no way that uh, he could win against uh, President Eisenhower. And uh, then in uh, 1959 or 1960, I'm not sure which, Craig uh, would know, Adley wrote an article for a magazine about how to improve presidential campaigns. It appeared in a magazine called This Week. I don't know if some of you are older or older remember this week, which was distributed with the Sunday newspapers. And in it, he called, the title that was put out was a great debate. And the idea was that the broadcasters would provide time without charge to the candidates for the candidates to appear, each alone, over a period of several weeks before the election. That time, the law, the equal time law, equal time law said if a broadcaster provides time for one candidate, sells it, gives it, whatever, must do the same for the other candidate. As a result, the broadcasters wanted to be free from the equal time law because there are as many as 40, 50 candidates for president at every election. 40 or 50, you can't have a debate with 40 or 50 candidates. So they were trying to get rid of the equal time law. The Senate was trying to figure out how to improve campaigns. And Senator Monroney read the article, called Adley and said, would you come down to Senate to testify about changing the equal time law and perhaps we can have debates for the presidency in 1960. I had helped uh, Governor Stevenson with the article and helped him with his testimony in the Senate. And the result was that Congress said, okay, we will suspend, not repeal. We will suspend one time only 
the, pres the equal time law for the 1960 campaign. That was late in the summer of 1960, weeks before the campaign was to begin. The broadcasters arranged the debates between Kennedy and Nixon. The first one was here in Chicago at Channel 2 Studios, and the result was history. President Kennedy said to many people, including me, I never would have been elected but for the presidential debates. I have a chapter, Craig and I have a chapter in the book, which is entitled How Adlai Stevenson Put Jack Kennedy in the White House, which is, in our view, really what happened, because without the debates, Kennedy would not have made it. There were no debates in 1964 because the Equal Time Law was still in effect and President Johnson did not want a debate. There were no debates in 1968. Nixon didn't want a debate. The Democrats had nominated their candidate very late. It never happened. 1972, there was no uh, televised debate. 1976, the League of Women Voters at its initiative, went to the Federal Communications Commission, <clears throat> said, we think you ought to re-examine your interpretation of the Equal Time Law. News events are exempt from equal time. We think a debate is a news event, and as such, should be not treated as requiring equal time. The FCC agreed with the League. The League of Women Voters then proceeded to try to organize the, debate, the first televised debate after 1960, which would have been in 1976. The League asked Frank Stanton, who had been the head of CBS, to be the chairman and organize the debate. Frank Stanton, who wanted to do it, said, I can't because of my contract with CBS, but there's a guy out in Chicago named Newt Minow, you ought to get him. So the league, I didn't know the people at the league, they called me, they came to see me and asked me to do this. And I was so interested in it, of course, I jumped at the opportunity. The first thing I did was to call a friend of mine who had later become a chairman of the FCC, Dean Birch, Dean Birch had been Goldwater's campaign manager, was chairman of the Republican uh, National uh, Party. And I told him uh, about this opportunity, and I said, would President Ford want a debate? The dean said, I'll call you back. I called Robert Lipschultz, whom I knew. He was Jimmy Carter's lawyer in Atlanta. And same thing, he said, I'll call you back. Dean called back, and he said, President Ford wants to debate. I said, I, wonderful. I said, I'm thrilled. I said, do you mind telling me why he wants it? We've never had an incumbent president to participate in a debate. He said, Newt, if you're 32 points behind, what the hell else are you gonna do? <laughs> Bob Lipschultz called. He said, Jimmy wants to debate. I said, do you mind telling me why? He said, Jimmy Carter knows he's 32 points ahead, but he's, a good debater, he's very confident as a debater. He doesn't think the country knows him, so he wants to debate. So because you had two willing candidates, we had a resumption of the presidential debates, 1976. Um, I negotiated the debates again for the league in 1980, and um, this time, I had two negotiators who were the best negotiators in the country on both sides. One was James Baker for the Republicans. The other was Bob Strauss for the Democrats. We got into an impasse in some issue or other, and the league was insisting on something, and the candidate said no. And Strauss said, excuse me, I have to go to the men's room. And a few minutes later, Baker said, excuse me, I have to go to the men's room. Yeah. The two of them were gone for about 10 minutes. 
When they came back, they pulled a piece of paper out of their coat pocket and they said, here's the deal. And without even looking at it, I said, it's done. If I'd still been arguing, the league would still be arguing with it. I said, it's done. All I wanted was to get the two of them to agree. And they did, and then we had the debate in 1980. 1984, I was not really that involved. The situation between the league and the candidates became so difficult. It, by the time it was over, they weren't talking to each other. Uh, candidates have certain things that they want. They're, they know they're shooting the whole election on this uh, race. The, can, the league wants certain things that it wants. It became impossible, and I was afraid the debates would not continue. 1986, I had a chance to uh, be a visiting fellow at the Kennedy School Institute of Politics at Harvard. So I took a leave from the firm for a few months. We organized a conference. We had the Republicans there. We had the Democrats there. We had all kinds of government uh, experts. And we organized what is now the Commission on Presidential Debates, which has conducted every debate successfully ever since, 1988, 1992, 1996, 2000, 2004, 2008. We will do it again this year. The debates this year will be, the first one will be October 3rd at the University of Denver. The second one will be the vice presidential debate will be October the 11th at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. Third will be on October 16th, Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. And the third presidential debate, final one, will be at Lynn University in Boca Raton, Florida, October 22. Our commission uh, met about a month ago in Washington. Uh, Jim Lair met with us, Jim Lair has been the moderator in more presidential debates than anyone else. He wants to retire and we're trying to persuade him to do at least one more. And we talked to him about what is the big issue this time is with all the new technology, with the internet, with the streaming, with Twitter, with all the new things, with young people, how do we adapt the debates to the new technology? Uh, how do we perhaps find a way for millions of people to send in their questions through the new technology so that their questions can be the ones that are asked of the candidates? We're talking to some of the smartest people in the technology business at uh, Yahoo, at AOL, at Google, and all the rest of them, we've had meetings with all of them. And I think you'll see some innovations of this time. What could be done, uh, one of the best things we've done is to open our doors and our experience to other countries. And as a result, you may have seen there was a presidential debate on television in Egypt last week. There was a big one in France. For the first time, there was a debate in the race for the head of the British government in the last British election. They're spreading all through the world, in Africa, uh, in Asia, in Europe. The use of television to educate and inform is unparalleled. You know, it's an experience that can be shared by all people simultaneously, and it's a very important one. I um, decided uh, at my age and experience that I owed uh, really to tell the whole story of the debates in a book. So I got my friend Craig LeMay, who you met, who is the best teacher at uh, Medill at Northwestern University to work with me, and we provided this, uh, this book. 
which tells the story of what happened, why it happened, you know, what's wrong, what could be better. Hardest problem is what do you do about third party candidates? Uh, who, who should decide whether a third party candidate participates? We've been sued by Ralph Nader, uh, by everybody. Uh, we were, last time was the first time we were not sued because <laughs> we have won every case in court. Our, our criteria for inclusion is that you must have 15% support taking the average of the five leading public opinion poll organizations in the country. You must also be on enough ballots to win the election. You must also be constitutionally eligible to uh, be president. Those are, that's our, the criteria we have. If you watch the Republican primary debates this year, as I did, I think I watched all of them. They were either 19 or 20. They were mostly sponsored by media itself. And they kept pushing their own, their own people uh, to, and they looked for sensationalism. They got to the point where they had nine candidates and said, if you agree with this, raise your hand on a very complicated question. They were, in my judgment, good in the sense the public got to see them, but bad in the sense they did not bring out intelligent uh, conversation or debate about the real issues. Senator McCain's chief television advisor has just invited me to come back to Harvard next month because he is working on a plan to have a thing like the Commission on Presidential Debates take over the primary debate as well. Uh, in the future. This originates with Senator McCain's Republican side. He's trying to get the Republicans, and the Democrats, and the independents together to work on this. Certainly there's a lot of room for improvement. I would like um, to stress one thing. We should not have a system which we have now where candidates have to raise millions and millions of dollars to buy time on television. <laughs> we are one of the few countries in the world that has such a system. It's not true in England. You cannot buy time for, for political commercials. It's not true in Europe, it's not true in Japan. Only in the United States do we have a system where the public airwaves owned by the public are being sold to candidates to purchase time, and it's wrong. The cost of campaigning for, I don't care which side you're on, Republican, Democrat, has become so ridiculously high that politics today has really become something for sale. Uh, and we don't want that in our country. The debates are one place, the one place left, where candidates do not pay for the time. It's provided as a public service. And it's got to be, in my opinion, enlarged. This is, I think democracy is really in many ways at stake. Um, I had an interesting experience with Richard Nixon. Two interesting experiences with Richard Nixon. <laughs> One, in 1961, I was in a uh, group of 10 who got an award from the uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce, so-called 10 Outstanding Young Men. It was in... Um, California, Santa Monica, California, and the speaker was Richard Nixon. It was at lunch. It was not long after the Kennedy-Nixon election. It was a couple of weeks after the inauguration of President Kennedy. And the 
speaker, Richard Nixon, arrived and he saw three of us talking together. One was Ted Sorensen, President Kennedy's advisor and speechwriter. And Pete Peterson, whom some of you, Bob, Bob knows very well. We were talking and Vice President Nixon came over to us and he talked to Ted, he knew Ted, he didn't know Pete, he didn't know me. He said, Ted, I wanna compliment you on that marvelous inaugural address President Kennedy gave. And Ted said, thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. He said, Ted, there were some things in it I liked so much, I wish I'd said them myself. Ted said, you mean the part about ask not what your country can do? And he said, no, 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 no. He said, I mean the part that began, I do solemnly swear. <laughs> Years later, Richard Nixon was in Chicago in 1966 or 67. He was campaigning for Republicans trying to uh, help him get the nomination for president in 1968. And he was being interviewed at uh, CBS at Channel 2. Channel 2 called me, they said, we think we ought to have a Democrat on the program with him, would you come over? And I came over and by God, it was in the same studio as the Kennedy-Nixon debate in 1960. And I walked in, I sat down next to Vice President Nixon. I said, do you know, uh, do you remember this place you are? He grabbed my arm, I still feel it. He said, do you think I could ever forget? <laughs> <laughs> but he knew about that, and I think he knew that that debate uh, had finished his chance at that time to be elected in 1960. So they're very important. Now with that, um, I hope you didn't hear the same thing from me that you heard from Craig, but I'd like to open it up for questions and discussion. The history of that is important. And when we had the conference at Harvard in 86, I knew the crucial thing was to get the Republicans and the Democrats on board. So our first two co-chairmen were the chairman of the Democratic Party and the chairman of the Republican Party. Um, and they continued as co-chairs for years. Now we've broadened it out to get away from the, the one of the, the co-chairmen, one of the co-chairmen is still the chair, was the chairman of the Republican Party, Frank Ferenkoff. The um, other co-chairman is was not ever a party official. We broadened it out. Father Jenkins of Notre Dame just joined our board. Um, we have a uh, Warren Buffett's son Howard is on the board. We have a, a, a diverse group representing. <laughs> as best we can, uh, a cross-section of America. We're criticized as being a self-perpetuating organization, but we haven't figured out a way to uh, not do that. Uh, we, um, I think, uh, do a, I, I've been on it forever. I've never once heard a partisan word expressed in the, in the uh, for example, I'll give you a very specific example. Last time in 2008, you may remember that Senator McCain decided not to participate in the first debate. Remember that? The country was in an economic crisis and he said, I'm not gonna, he said, we should all go to Washington and meet in the White House. And uh, we had a, a tele telephonic meeting of the commission and uh, we all said, we have to go ahead because we announced the date months ago, the place. If we change it because of this, we'll never be able to. 
it, and I said this, and Senator Simpson, Al Simpson, who's on the commission, he said, Newt is right, let's go ahead. That was the end of it. There had never been any partisanship in this. What we're interested in is having the debate uh, and um, having them done fairly. Another criticism we get is who are the moderators? Why are there moderators? If it were up to the commission, I think we'd just have the two candidates. But the candidates don't want that. They want questions to come at them because they don't want to appear to be the nasty, mean person who's asking tough questions. They want to be Mr. Nice Guy. And uh, so they want the question. We, now we're getting a uh, group question. We're getting panelists of citizens. We're trying to, as best we can, make the debates as spontaneous as possible. Why are the answers so short? That's because the candidates insist on short answers. It's not because we want, the commission wants. You gotta remember, there's a 13th Amendment in this country. You can't make somebody be in a debate. You can't put a gun at the Democratic candidate, the Republican candidate, you gotta show up here. You, it's gotta be something they are willing to do. That they're willing to participate. So you have to find something that the candidates can agree on. Bob? Uh, you obviously are very enthusiastic about the presidential debate. Are you equally enthusiastic about the white, the, uh, the primary candidate debate? No, I'm not, because particularly not this year. They were, my, there was no Democratic race, but on the Republican side, first of all, there were too many. Second, they were spun to promote the media, uh, the, the media person who was, who, was, uh, who was on, and the media itself. And third, they had commercials in the midst of them. Uh, they, were, they were not seen as a public service. They were provided as, 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 as a uh, way to get a big audience and, and sell a lot of commercials. So I was not satisfied. Yes. I said that. Oh, you said that? <laughs> 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 How many of you watch the uh, PBS News Hour every night? That's the one place where you can get all sides of an issue in an unhurried, uh, thoughtful way. Most of the, if you watch the local news, it's a fire or a murder or a rape or a, some uh, terrible thing that's happened. Uh, there was a study done of how long a candidate's words, his or her own words, appeared on the news. It was something like less than 14 seconds. Uh, so we're not getting the, the, I happen to be a news junkie, my, a television news junkie myself, and I watch it all. And unfortunately, uh, less and less of it is of a, of a more thoughtful way. Yeah. You're all familiar with Citizens United? 
so the, I, I, as a lawyer, I have a hard time understanding the Supreme Court's view that speech is money and that money is speech. In fact, I wrote a piece about this and I said, suppose you're a lawyer arguing a case in the Supreme Court and the rules are you're entitled to 30 minutes. And you say, well, I can't make my argument in 30 minutes. I'd like to buy 30 more minutes. And you go to the clerk's office with a check. And you say, I'd like to buy 30 more minutes. And they'd say, well, how can you say that? Well, speech is money. Money is speech. It's ridiculous. Money is not speech. The Supreme Court went off the wrong course years ago when it said, it's okay to limit contributions, but not limit expenditures. That was the Bucky Vallejo case decided, what, 15 years ago or something like that. 76, farther, long, farther away than I thought. Second, they went wrong on Citizens United and went wrong also in saying that corporations are, are, are people. And how do you change that? I think there is a case, believe it or not, that may go back to the Supreme Court from Montana, which where Mont the Montana Supreme Court recently decided a case saying Citizen United was wrong because it, it said that unless there was proof of corruption arising from money in politics, you couldn't regulate it. Well, in Montana, they had plenty of proof of corruption, and they said, we're just not going to follow it. I think it may go back to the Supreme Court. If not, it's just going to take time until the court changes its mind. I'm trying right now. The current law, not a change in the law, the current law says if there's a political commercial, it has to, you have to file with the station who the real sponsor is, what's being paid for it. The FCC has just recently ruled within the last two weeks that that will now go on the internet and the public will find that out. The more transparency, the better. One good thing about Citizens United is that it called for more transparency. And uh, that, that's got to be the way we push for it so the public will become more, more aroused and more active. Yes. Some countries have very short campaigns. That's true in England, it's true in Israel, it's true in France. There are a lot of rules about when, those are parliamentary systems. Under our system, which is not a parliamentary system, it's pretty tough to change it. It's like a free for all. It would be much better if we had short campaigns. Now our campaigns are perpetual. Uh, and the raising money is perpetual. It's, I, I don't know how we're going to change it. They're, they're, unfortunately, today's politics leaves, Adley and I were talking about it in the car coming out here. His father wouldn't believe the way politics has developed uh, today. Yes. Is there a way to make the different stations um, Change their attitude about being <laughs> Well, I have advocated, but I never had enough votes uh, to get it done, to require a certain amount of time made available to the candidates without charge, and that they couldn't buy time. That's the British system. That's the system in. The Netherlands, it's a system in France, it's a system in Japan, <coughs> it's a system pretty much throughout the rest of the world. Only we are not on that system. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We have a flat rule. We have a flat rule. No audience participation, period. No yelling, no clapping, no nothing. That's it. How, how do the um, audiences get invited? Are they invited by the all these debates now take place at universities where they have a big auditorium. The university has a certain number of tickets. The candidates have a certain number of tickets. What's left over is available to the public, but not very many. It's really designed to be seen on television. I've been at the debates. I've watched it on television. Believe me, it's better to watch it on television. Yeah. In, in, in response to uh, the question about how can we shorten these campaigns that seem to get longer and longer and longer and more expensive, I served on a commission many years ago, I think it was back in the 80s, uh, chaired by Mel Laird, former uh, Republican Republican member of Congress and Secretary of Defense. And we deliberated that issue and came up with a suggestion which I've never heard of Tina say anybody. <laughs> but um, we, Republican Democrats, unanimously uh, recommended federal legislation that would require all of the states to hold their primaries on one of three dates. The first starting in June. In other words, June, July, August, and the debates are behind you. That would not only shorten the campaign that's keep getting longer, but it would tend, we thought, to force the candidates also to focus on national, you know, on national constituents and national uh, issues instead of tracing around state by state by state, appealing to local uh, interests. Um, I've never heard of any other way of doing it even if the idea is still a problem. I didn't know about that, and I think it's a good idea. The, the idea that Iowa and New Hampshire should have such an important role. I, I wrote a piece about this once in the Wall Street Journal. I pointed out that Jimmy Carter won the Democratic nomination in 1976 with 23,000 votes in New Hampshire. That is less than it takes to carry one of Chicago's 50 wards. Why? Why do we have that system? I never had much. He won in New Hampshire, but not by as large a majority as the best required. And then he came from New Hampshire, and so they cut him out. And then he came to Illinois, which is a big, um, pivotal state, and he won overwhelmingly in the uh, popularity contest in, the, in our in our primary in the best plan. He lost. I think most of his argument to the um, Democratic convention, when he pulled out, I sent him a telegram. And I said, I ran as a Muskie delegate. My slogan was, it takes a minnow to bring in a Muskie. <laughs> but I've learned it takes more than a minnow to bring in a Muskie. Muskie, uh, yeah. it seems to me, uh, this is not on the topic we're talking about. What's happening to the Republican Party today is the reverse of what happened to the Democratic Party in 1972. In 1972, the Democratic Party was taken over by the left. In 2012, the Republican Party seems to be, when you look at what happened to Senator Lugar, the Republican Party seems to be taken over by the right. We, we, we go, go to the extremes, and that's a very sad thing. I was never a Democrat until I went to work for Adlai Stevenson as governor. I became a Democrat because of his 
views, and he explained to me why it was important to have two parties who were not that far apart, that there were people in both parties who, who uh, could form a common interest. That's been disappearing. But this idea, I never heard that idea before. Yes. Because of your familiarity with the mechanics of the, of the state rules, both in, also in terms of primaries, and any you know, opinion on that or any of the other rules involving how we conduct either elections or primaries that you were concerned about or you want to take us to that? I'm not as uh, knowledgeable about that as I should be, but I do know that the Electoral College has really ended up with about eight or nine states out of 50 as being regarded as in play and that the other 41 or 42 really don't count. And that's not a rational system either. We've got a lot of irrational parts of our electoral process. 